So you have a one-man show that you're yes, on Broadway. I do, uh, when you were first approached with the idea of the show, what were your initial feelings and what drew you into to accept the project? Well, I was never approached because me and my wife would watch Chaz Parmentary, A Bronx Tale on stage, and a hotel in Vegas, and we saw it, and at the end, it was just such an amazing show. If you ever saw it on the stage, it's better than the movie. Mm -hmm. It's one man doing the whole movie, it's better than the movie. He should have just done the movie by himself. <laughs> but, um,. I said, baby, I think I can do this because when I'm in Europe and Asia, I'm on stage telling people about my life, but the only difference is I'm taking questions from the crowd. But in this particular situation, I won't take questions. I do it like Mr. Palmateri from an artistic point of view. And um, yes, we, um, we've got a producer. He put it together for two weeks. It was sold out every night. And um, I was in Poland, Spike Lee was in Brazil, and he said, uh, Mike, we heard about the show, somebody that worked for Spike viewed the show, and he said, you should see the show. And Spike wanted to put it on Broadway, and once he put it on Broadway, it took on a life of his own, and that's why we're here today. All right, and having played on uh, the one person in the Broadway play, anything you learned about yourself that maybe you hadn't noticed or paid too much attention to in the past? I guess that I'm always, um, I'm always worried about failing. You know what I mean? That's a big motivation factor for me to do well because I don't want to fail. And I always know it's a possibility of failing when you're dealing with live audience like in fighting. And have the same um, emotions. You feed off the people and hope that you do real well and you make the right decisions when you're making these choices from um, these people's emotions of what they want. And um, it's pretty nerve wracking and I realize that I'm pretty insecure. I want to succeed, even if I'm, even if I'm not doing well enough, I still want to succeed. And I'm drive off, and I, I'm more driven for success than I am for money. And those are the things I find out about myself. And I think it's really shallow, but it's just, um, it's just who I am. Okay, and if we could just switch to boxing, uh, real quick, talking about the state of the heavyweight division as of today. At one time, you were the undisputed king of boxing and that division. What are your views on how the division has changed and? Uh, the boxers that are currently in that division? I don't know. The fight, the Klitschko brothers are fighting well. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Win. You know, regardless if people say it's not exciting enough, I'm a strong believer that boxing should be exciting. It should be like entertainment. The people should entertain the crowd by hurting the guy because that's what they came to see, the guy get hurt. They want to see somebody get knocked out or beaten to a pulp, so to speak. And um, that's not happening. You know, people don't have the bad intentions. They don't want to hurt the other opponent. Or either the officials make bad decisions. Or else, normally, when you see a fight, it's such a mismatch. You know who's going to win before the fight even starts. And that's what I think is just giving boxing a bad eye. And, uh, you know, picking up on that, Floyd Mayweather, who is currently pound for pound the undisputed king of the sport, what are your views on him and the success that he's had during his career? He's not good. It's going to be a long time before somebody beat him. He's such crafty fights, masterful in the style that he employs. And it's just really going to be difficult to beat him. And how do you view today as possibly being able to take the torch and become the next great fighter in the sport? Well, there's a bunch of fighters that are very capable of being great once Mr. Mayweather's not around anymore because there's great fighters there, just that he captures most of the attention and it's very, he overshadows them so much that you never really know who they are. But there's great fighters out there and there continue to be great fighters. And um, let's see what happened in time. Boxing has been in the dull drums before and like myself, people have come to emerge to be sensational stars and knocking out people and giving the crowds what they want. And as far as the one-man show is concerned, is there one point that you would like people to take away from your performance whenever they leave the theater after seeing it? No, um, I never do. I use my job is just to entertain them. I, I just wanted, at first when I did the show, I just wanted it to be a serious show and people to look at the show. And it's almost like Melly Collin, but it becomes more of a comic situation than ever. And I didn't know how to take it. Other than particularly laughing at me as a person, that this guy, I can't believe this guy's up here. But no, they just thought the situations in the, um, were funny. And I thought, well, as long as they're laughing, it's a good show. And so we just took it from there. I, used to, I was happy to make them laugh. But when the show is over, what I really get is now I understand why this happened, I understand why this happened, I understand why this happened. And I'm very grateful in being able to do this, and that's what I try to um, convey in every interview is gratitude. All right. And then we've had uh, a lot of young stars recently getting in trouble. I'd say Chris Brown recently. He's just been released from jail. 
being someone that, as a younger person, has been in, you know, different situations, any advice you would give these young stars and celebrities of today that may be potentially leading down the wrong road or down the road of trouble? Well, you know, when I was a young guy, I didn't listen to anybody. And I don't expect anyone to want to listen to me either, you know, because look at all these mistakes that I made. But I, this is what I know, you know, with guys like Chris, um, they're building a record on you. They're building, you know, um, we have this on you, we have this on you. When they continue, they're going to build enough, you know, when they build this more, this big mountain of um, catastrophes on you, then they're going to put you where guys that like to fight all, every, all day at. If he likes to fight, he wants to be a tough guy, they're going to put you where guys fight all day and they don't do anything about it. And then you're going to be like me. I used to be like that, fighting aggressive. Then they took, sent me to a place where guys fight every day, all day. And I realized I don't want to fight no more. When I came out, I realized I'm not that tough guy. I don't want to fight no more. And um, I hope he, don't have to, he doesn't have to experience that. I think he's a nice kid. And sometimes we just get caught up in all this hype out here. And um, no one can help you going in there alone. You ain't going in there with your bodyguards and your friends and the friends' guns and stuff. And I'm not saying Chris has all this stuff. I just hope he, you know, has the right people around him because he has to stop doing this. It's, a, it's an aggressive charge. And once they, uh, once they, um, they pile these aggressive charges on you, that gives them the right to put you in a situation, a facility where there's a lot of aggressive people. They're not going to put you in the facility where there's no aggressive people if you're very aggressive. You know, and this is, just, this is what I know. So they're going to put you with people just like yourself that's very aggressive. And I don't think he wants to do that. I'm not saying he's, he's soft or he's a man, but I don't, think, I'm, I don't think I'm soft. I think I'm an animal where I used to be. I don't want to be in that situation no more. I just don't want to be, in, I don't want to be around those kind of people no more. I don't care who you could be. People kill you, they jump you, they do stuff in this bad place. He don't need to be in that place. You know, he has all these, you know, you'll come out of there broken, and all your girlfriends will come, they won't want to be with you no more, but they'll hug you and feel sorry for you. You know, my, my ex-girlfriend with their boyfriend, oh, I feel sorry for them. They feel sorry for me. And I'm like, holy, when I came out of prison, God. You know? So, um, I used to, man, listen, man, we got to enjoy what we have here. We can't give it away. I kept doing my whole life away getting caught up with thinking I'm the baddest man on the planet. Nobody better talk to me or look at me a certain way. So I'm telling you, I'm the first guy to tell you, that's all garbage. It's all garbage. We have to live this life and take care of our family while we're out here. Because, you know, this is a small increment of our life. We're going to make this money, uh, be successful. So we have to take advantage of it and take care of our families and the people that we love. All right. And last thing before we get out of here, if you could just let the millions of fans around the world, let, uh, let them know where they can go online get information about you, information about the... Hey, listen, I don't know anything about going online and unless they're talking to the wrong guy. There's my publicist over there. I don't know. The only thing I know how to do is put the, the, the game, the computer on. I don't know none of this typing online. You want me to tell it to him yeah, or something? You, just, you know what? It's a plug Iron Mike um, Productions.com. Iron Mike Productions.com. What else, Joe? That's it. All right. So good. Thank you very much for the interview today. It was a uh, honor. You look he dog geeked out. I knew he was going to walk in. Well, I can't do this, dude. I knew this was the geek. Like, my nephew's totally geeked out. <laughs>